Welcome to the Further Gospel Podcast, where we provide sound doctrine for everyday people. I'm your host, Costi Hinn, and I want to welcome our listeners on Apple and Spotify, and those of you enjoying this on our YouTube video podcast format. On today's episode, I want to continue our series designed to help you win this Christmas. So it's appropriately called Five Priorities for Winning This Christmas. That's the series we're in, and we've covered Christ, we've covered family, and if you haven't already listened to those, you should, because they preclude today's priority, which is generosity. Now, as a reminder, when I use the language winning this Christmas, I'm talking about getting to the other side of the season and having kept the main thing the main thing, being someone who's filled with joy, someone who set the calendar the right way, someone who even through trials stayed centered on Christ, someone who even when materialism beckoned your heart, you kept it in its place and someone who even during work parties didn't ruin their witness and those who when it all was said and done were resting assured looking back that this advent season they did not roll over for the culture and they didn't get pinned down all the way by worldly pursuits are we going to wrestle with some of those things of course we are but winning as i would put it is maintaining a lifestyle of worship. Notice lifestyle, the habitual pattern, the general trajectory of worship unto Christ this season. And the third priority here for winning this Christmas is generosity. Now to begin, I wanna provide you with a theology of generosity so you really get the biblical framework. Now when we use the word theology, of course, we are meaning the, the logic of God or the view of God, biblical truth about a certain topic. So here, theological truth number one, generosity is God's will for us. That's a bedrock or baseline truth here. Whether you consider yourself to be rich or poor, all Christians are called to be selfless, generous, grace-driven givers. That last phrase is key. What do I mean by grace-driven? Well, it means that God's grace is the driving motivation for all Christian generosity. So this episode and the focus of generosity as a priority isn't about you just feeling good, although, hey, the Bible says it's better to give than to receive. We'll talk about that shortly. It can feel good to give. And it's not just about, uh, you know, some, some tax write-off, although there could be a tax benefit that you get for giving in the modern context. And uh, maybe there is some sort of uh, response from someone who says, wow, when you gave or I saw you do that thing, right? I, I got wind of your generosity, even if you weren't flaunting it it inspired me to do the same. Hey, that's great. But ultimately, none of that is the driving motivation for you and I as believers. Grace is what drives us. That's what the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. Paul the Apostle makes it clear. He's talking about the Macedonians in those chapters. If you want a reminder, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, two great chapters to read on this. The Macedonians were poor, and yet they were so eager to give to others. And there's 10 truths that emerge from these chapters. They help us set a theological foundation for generosity. Let me give you them really quick. This will take about a minute. Number one, they were giving as the result of the grace of God. There's grace-driven giving. That's chapter 8, verse 1 in the book of 2 Corinthians. They were giving in tough times and in poverty. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2 tells us they were joyful and cheerful. 2 Corinthians 8, 2 and chapter 9, verse 7 tells us. And then fourth, it was based on ability, not mandated percentages. And so they weren't like, man, I really got to get to 10% or 20% or 50% or it's got to be this. It was ability as the Lord has given, we're going to. And then fifth, another mark of grace-driven giving is it's sacrificial. That's 2 Corinthians 8, 3. Then voluntarily, Paul says, not by way of compulsion. Well, they were excited. They wanted to. Nobody was manipulating them. They were understanding grace-driven giving and why they give and then doing it. Number seven, with a sense of eager participation in gospel work. So there is the forefront of their thinking, the gospel, God's work moving forward, the Lord being pleased, what he's given, we want to do, which leads into number eight. They were giving out of love for the Lord in 2 Corinthians 8, 5. And then in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, we see they were giving generously as the Lord provides. So with, in a sense, two open hands, one hand to receive and one hand to give. And then 10th, they were trusting God 
And in doing so, they were believing he'll replenish what he wants according to his will so that more can be given. So there's the ecosystem of giving and receiving, receiving and giving. And that's in 2 Corinthians 9 verses 10 and 11. And what a refreshing difference Paul's words are. Uh, from so many sermons you might hear that pull Old Testament verses out of context and apply them however a preacher may fancy, or maybe the guilt trip that you or I have heard before or been put under, that if you're not giving a certain percentage, you're robbing God and that he's not going to bless you and you're not going to this or that. And giving can seem like uh, such a, a law-driven exercise. And all of a sudden, grace-driven giving is out the window. You're forgetting even why you do it. You're just afraid of God's hammer falling on your life or not being blessed or not having enough. And so you give out of compulsion. Well, this is not going to help you to have the happiest Christmas in the biblical manner of happiness. Biblical giving will. Generosity driven by grace will. See, giving isn't an issue of law. It's an issue of the heart. The Macedonians were poor, but they gave generously. They didn't scowl in obedience to the law. They rejoiced. It was a privilege. So the idea isn't, oh, I have to give. It's I get to give. And that is the perfect picture of how a Christian is to give in the new covenant or under the new covenant in Christ. And so when properly understood, theological truth one is very simple. Now, theological truth number two, God owns everything everything that the believer has. So you might want to say, God owns it all. And I want you to get this in your heart this Christmas and beyond. You and I actually don't own anything. And no, this isn't some kind of new socialism or these communist sentiments you hear out there where you'll own nothing and be happy. And I mean, some of you have been reading those articles or watching those videos on YouTube where they are telling us we're going to eat bugs and the government's going to reduce our meat consumption and everyone starts freaking out. Listen, I need you to put on the mind of Christ here. That's not what I'm talking about. Like you'll own nothing and be happy. Here's what I mean. You can own a lot of things on paper, but really biblically, spiritually, truly, eternally, you are a manager you're a steward of what God has given you. That's how uh, heaven views your assets. God owns you. God owns your assets. God is the one who's given you the ability to earn your wealth. And so he is to be the eternal affection in your heart as a Christian. And you're to know he's who gave it. I'm a steward. And so while again, the world or the bank says you own the deed to your house in your spiritual thinking or the mind of Christ with your eternal perspective, you're saying, no, ultimately, while I own it on paper, God is the one who's given this. You're a steward. Our money is God's. And what we do with it is very much his business. And so generosity by way of priority during the Christmas season means what you do or what you buy, what we do with our money very much involves Christ. We want to think of him with each decision. And I've got some really helpful truths to come still later in this episode that will help you if you're one of those people that thinks, well, oh no, I can't buy anything. Well, God can't possibly be you know, involved in my shopping cart at this store or that store. We'll slow down. We'll talk more about what his good gifts can look like. But really, Psalm 24, 1, is that the earth is is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All of it belongs to God. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, Psalm 50 verse 10 says, and he owns the soul and requires it of men, Luke 12, 20. The Bible says in Haggai 2, 8, through the prophet, God declares the silver and gold is mine. Scripture again and again makes it clear, God owns everything. You and I, were just managers. So we wanna think of that as well. That's a theological truth that operates as a foundation for everything we do. And then theological truth number three, God gives you gifts to enjoy. Don't miss that. Listen to the words of 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 to 20 right now. I'll read them to you. Instruct those who are rich. This is Paul telling Timothy. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Notice the language there. Not the uncertainty of riches, but on God. What does that mean? God is certain. God is steady. God is sure. God is faithful. And then Paul goes on, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Well, there's a principle right there. God is the one you look to, and he is the one who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So you're allowed to enjoy things. He says then in verse 18, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share 
What does that do? Verse 19, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, Paul says, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. He's saying you need to be looking forward to the future, treasure in heaven, eternity in what you do here and now with what I've given you. Uh, I want to be this way. I hope you will too, that we would view money and materialism in balance, that God isn't a cosmic killjoy who gives you money and then demands you're never allowed to enjoy something. Yet those who have been blessed financially are to use wisdom with their hopes and their security, meaning like Proverbs 23, 5 says that wealth has wings. You're not holding on to it so tightly, forgetting it's going to go anyway. You can't hold on to it. You can't create some hedge of protection from life's trials. You certainly can't protect yourself from spiritual attacks with money. The rich can sometimes be guilty of thinking that their money can insulate them from danger. And we all get sucked into this thinking that if I just have more, or if I just have this, or I just have that, well, then I'm going to be independent and untouchable. You know, nothing can get me or nothing can get my family. Christians are called to know better than that. And Christmas can be a time where materialism drives us into thinking, and this is a lie, by the way, that the more we buy and the more we have and the bigger and better the Christmas was, well, we've reached some sort of there, there. And one thing that we've often said in our home is there's no there, there. Because you get there and you realize, eh, nothing satisfies but Christ. We can earn wealth, we can amass wealth, but we need to be generous with our wealth and keep wealth in its place. Uh, I love the way Paul says, God richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So I don't want you feeling guilty if you've got a nice home or a nice car, or you wear quality clothing, or you go on a beautiful vacation this Christmas, or maybe next year, or this one for some Christians who may struggle. What if you have multiple properties? Are you not allowed to have an investment portfolio? I mean, what if God has given you a lot and now you say, well, I'm just not allowed to have anything. I have to appear poor and live poor and I can't wear it, can't drive it, can't do anything with it. Oh, I've just got to, I've got to keep giving everything away so that I'm poor. And then eventually you're kind of a bad steward because you've never really done what the Bible also says, which is Proverbs 6, 6, go to the ant, you sluggard. Look how it does what it needs to in seasons building up its storehouse for what's to come. So the idea that you don't ever save because you're just too busy trying to be poor because you're not allowed to enjoy anything is not biblical. The idea that you don't leave your children an inheritance if you have the ability to is actually unwise. Proverbs has so much wisdom on this. So I want you to see that God is most interested or most after, if you will, your heart. What is driving you this Christmas? What is the source of your happiness? What makes you feel secure? Is it stuff? Well, then put stuff in its place. Is having a lot of money the source of your happiness or feeling protected? Well, you need to put that perspective in its place and go back to what the Bible reminds us as believers, that God wants the heart. And so what are we doing with our assets? What are we doing with our wealth? How are we serving his purposes? So with those foundational truths clear, theological truth one, two, and three, we've got the foundation laid. How should we be generous this Christmas? How should we prioritize this to get the most out of Christmas and not be run around uh, like a, a puppet on a string by materialism? Number one, see generosity as a joyful privilege. It truly is more blessed to give than to receive for a Christian. You know, we're wired that way, God has wired believers to joyfully give and see it as a privilege. So we don't have to give, even if it's a command in scripture, we want to think, oh, I get to give. What a joy. Number two, see generosity as an act of worship. Don't just see it as something that you do in order to get a tax receipt or because you have to, or because you felt guilt tripped or because someone else was. No, 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 no. In all you do, let your generosity be as unto the Lord. It's worship, which is a bowing down before God. So in a very literal way, your generosity is you laying what he's given you back at his feet in worship. There's no better way to view giving or generosity than worship. And this Christmas especially, that all you have is from Christ and for Christ. And third, give generously to your local church first. The priority of the local church is something we should all keep in the forefront of our minds all year long. 
And for some Christians, look, let's be honest, it may not be as exciting for you to give to your church because it seems like the same thing week in and week out. And I know there's nuances. Some of you probably are thinking these right now. Well, what if I'm in between churches or what if I don't really trust my church or what if I'm going through a challenging season with my church or what if they weren't responsible with money in the previous season? And what about, what about? Sure. Look to the word and process those nuances through a biblical worldview and a faithful mindset according to scripture. But in most all cases, being obedient to give is a now thing. And we want to prioritize our local church first. That is the place and the people that feed us and lead us. That is what pours into our life. The local church fuels much of the ministry that pours back into you. And so generosity with our local church is so key. And fourth, give generously then to ministries that you trust. I know a good number of you are so supportive of this ministry, and I'm thankful that you do. And we don't take that lightly at all. We would never want to misuse or abuse people's trust. But in addition to that, there are ministries that focus on the poor. They focus on ministry to widows and orphans. There's ministries that are focused on international outreach. There's so many different ministries that are serving uh, moms that are single this time of year. Those in the prison system that are cut off from folks. I have a dear brother who leads a prison ministry and so many others. And so do your homework and seek to give to those who are hurting this time of year and seek to give to ministries that are targeting or advancing sound doctrine, the message of the gospel that are an extension. You know, the parachurch is all that any of us are in this regard, talking about for the gospel and other ministries to come alongside the church and support the church. But listen, Jesus never promised to build our nonprofit ministry. He promised to build his church. He does that through people. And that means that we need to be focused on where we locally assemble and how the Lord is strengthening people there. And then secondarily partnering together to reach outward to others. Very important that you see the order of your generosity in that way. And finally, fifth, review your financial and material portfolio. What do I mean by that? After December or hey, maybe even before, maybe now, prayerfully review your financial decisions. Review your giving. Uh, review your, your lifestyle this year or your approach to things. What you bought. Why did you buy it? And this doesn't and really shouldn't be a trip down, you know, guilty lane, but rather it should be a wise and prudent process where you assess and you pray. You consider areas where you might grow in or make small pivots this year if there's still time and or repeat these decisions next year because you, by the grace of God, made strides this year in ways you hadn't before. And remember the goal, friends, keeping Christ the center. Can you remember that always when on these podcasts or in our resources, I hit you with imperatives or I, I press in on various cultural things or in the first episode, I talk about Santa and I make certain statements that press in on maybe some of your traditions or other things. I'm not here trying to be a Scrooge and say, oh, you can't enjoy anything. It can't even have a tree. You know, it's just all, you know, bah humbug Christmas. No, hear me on this. It's that we need to be vigilant and I'm going to use, I'm going to use the M word militant. Okay. Not aggressive fundamentalists, but just militant and vigilant about one thing. Anything that comes in like an imposter that pulls our eyes or our affections, our hopes, or that little uh, increased heart rate because we're starting to get excited, but Christ or like Christ, anything like that, that seeks to pull our eyes away. You need to be vigilant and militant about putting it in its place. That means that some things might need to go, but it usually means other things just need to go lower on the list of prioritization. Your generosity, even your desire, you know, to, to do better at things this Christmas has got to come from a place of genuine love for Christ, first love mentality, wanting to please him, or having had the truth of his word, open your eyes, and you said, I just never considered that before, or maybe you forgot. Okay, everything goes back to one person, him, Christ, where your affections are driving everything, your affections for him. And so remember that as you seek to make decisions or quote unquote, do better at something, 
Jesus has got to be your motivation and mine. So there's number three on our list of five priorities for winning this Christmas. It's generosity. Let's be balanced. Let's be biblical. Let's be generous for the glory of God and the good of others this Christmas season and beyond. Next episode, we'll dig into priority number four and shift our eyes upward to eternity. As always, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you to so many of you who have supported our ministry all year. For so many of you who have been giving one-time gifts as the close of the year uh, comes upon us, we're so excited to continue to steward what God has given in a way that provides sound doctrine for everyday people. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, get all our free content there, or go to forthegospel.org to look through our resources, uh, check out more about our ministry, or become a gospel patron by partnering with our ministry financially. I'll be back next Monday with another episode. Keep on living for the gospel.